Oh, Julie. Um, really quick, this has nothing to do with anything, but I used to be a revival group pastor in first year. Yeah. And uh, one of my students who hated first year, um, but grew into loving it and now is changing the world, is here and it's her birthday. She came to celebrate her birthday with me here, and that's awesome. So let's just sing happy birthday to her, shall we? <laughs> Rachel, ready? Happy birthday. Oh, stand up. To you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rachel. She lives in England now, so I don't always get to see her. Yeah, woo! <laughs> okay. This is gonna be an untraditional church service. You can tell because we started by singing happy birthday. Get, get prepared, the rest is gonna be just like that. Um, I am so excited to be here. I was feeling so in awe and worship. Sometimes you just, when you think about all that God has done, it can be overwhelming. And I have one of those stories where it doesn't make any sense that God could get somebody so redeemed and so healed, except that he's an expert at it. And when I look back at my life, I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, you're so amazing. And I'm thinking about like his love, an encounter with his love changes everything. An encounter with him and I was, you know, I used to know him here. And when you know him here, it shakes your world up. And you can never live a normal, boring, tormented life again. And so I, I feel the Lord. I feel like tonight is, to, is supposed to be a night where people actually, their hearts are opened to encounter him in a way that they haven't felt in here. And that our minds are opened up in a way where truth makes sense. See, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's supposed to be that we feel and encounter him and we know the truth of who he is at the same time. And so that's, that's what we're doing. We're going after it. We're going after our hearts knowing God and our truth finder, our mind finding him too. So um, I, I want to start with when I was 12, a very dramatic event happened in my life that forever changed everything. I started my period. And now the men are like, what am I doing in this church service? We sang happy birthday and she's talking about her period. <laughs> Any first timers to Bethel, you're like, oh my gosh. Okay, I joke about it, but the truth is it was very dramatic in my life because I am, was like the woman with the issue of the blood in the Bible. So when I started my period, it went forever. And um, men, you don't maybe know what this is like unless you have a wife or a teenage sister. And then you know, like, we just go crazy. Hormones make you crazy. And so um, starting at the age of 12, I had intense, you just imagine, teenagers already have crazy emotions. Um, hormones are like, let's turn all of those emotions up full blast. So, um, so I remember everything about my teenage experience was extreme torment. I hated myself. I had anxiety attacks all the time. The first time I th thought I wanted to die was when I was seven. So by the time I was 12, we'd really picked up steam with that. I was really suicidal. I had shame. Um, you name it. I was bound up. And then I had this physical problem that made everything more intense emotionally. So all that I want to tell you is that I have a PhD in emotions. And then after that, I grew up and I, I spent years doing inner healing and working through stuff with the Lord and having encounter after encounter with who he is. And, and as you experience him, it's like wave after wave, circle after circle of torment just falls off. And what is amazing about God is whatever you face and you overcome, you get to reproduce. So all of it, like I hated my story when I was younger because I didn't know I had one. I didn't know that I would actually be able to live in peace and hope and joy. I didn't know that I could actually like myself and be happy. And so 
I um, now what I do as a job. I worked in the school of ministry for a few years, and now I do life consulting. Me and my husband work with thousands of people, helping them walk through emotional stuff. So, what am I telling you? I understand emotions because I've had them all. <laughs> you name some kind of crazy emotion, I got it. In fact, I'm just going to show you a little bit about like what my life is like. So, if you guys just want to show, this is my um, this is. This great. Okay. This is me. And uh, when I have hormones, I have unlogical emotions. And so I will start crying at any given thing. And so this was a particular day when I had watched The Office. And Michael Scott left the office. Now, I knew he left the office because I've watched the whole series like four times. So I knew this episode he leaves. And yet, when he left, I could not stop crying for like two hours. I know, crazy. Okay, then this next one, will you show this next one? This was me. <laughs> Let's be real talk, okay? And, um, and so yesterday I was sitting there and uh, America's Got Talent came on. <laughs> and there is a black choir on there. And I am crying because of why am I not black and can't sing and can't dance and why am I not in a choir? <laughs> you know, so I know what it is to have emotions. And if I can figure out how to navigate emotions so they don't run my life, having literally chemicals in my body that go against that, if I can find abundant life, anyone can. If I can actually live in hope and peace and joy and not have things like flip me upside down, then I promise you, you can too. So we're going to talk about emotions and where to put them. And that sounds like, what are we doing? We're in church. We're talking about emotions. Why does that even matter? Because God is an emotional God. So this is the best thing I've ever heard. It's a quote from a movie. Emotions are like kids. You cannot throw them in the trunk of your car. <laughs> but you cannot let them drive it. And so we're going to talk about how you do this balance with the Lord. And I think David was one of the most profound, emotionally relevant people in the Bible. God calls him a man after his own heart. And how did David live? He lived wildly. He expressed himself. He was, you know, screaming and yelling and crying and moaning and groaning and praising and jumping around naked. He did all of the emotions. So if you think God doesn't like emotions, that would be an odd candidate for God to pick. And so we'll, I, let's just read Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me? Forever? There was an extra word there. <laughs> How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. This is what... This looks like. Our life is meant to be this. We express what we need to express with the Lord. We are real. We are honest. And then we get right back in line with truth. And we stick right there. Um, I think Bill Johnson said this, but I, I don't want to mess it up. It could be any of the Bethel people. It's just in my notes somewhere. It says... The ability to hold on to truth even when you don't feel it is integrity. So we're going to talk just, uh, we're going to go about all different kinds of things. Um, just two things, I mean, not all different kinds. Two. We're going to talk about don't throw your feelings in the trunk. And we're going to talk about don't let them drive your car. You ready? So the first thing, this is what I see happen most. And why do we need to have feelings? Because God wants to encounter us in our heart. Knowing him in our mind is not enough. 
it's boring, it's repressive, it's judgmental. If you know him but you don't experience him ever, it's really easy to cast stones at other people. Knowing him in your mind is the, is you, without ever experiencing him, without ever encountering him, makes it close to get to religion. Okay? So we actually need our hearts to connect to God. I think about um, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. There's these two disciples. Jesus had died. They don't know he's risen. And Jesus comes up and he's walking with them, but Jesus is like hiding kind of. He's like wearing sunglasses and maybe a, a turban or something. Hide that hair that's glowing. And so he comes up and he's like, hey, what you guys doing? And they're like, oh, my gosh, we're so sad. Jesus died and we thought he was the Messiah. And so then they talk and they go on this whole road and then they end up asking him to stay. They go in, he breaks bread, and as soon as he breaks bread, they realize this is Jesus. And what do they say? We're not our hearts burning within us. See, if you don't actually feel, then you get to, you'll miss that thing of the burning within us. You actually have to be able to have emotions. Uh, in the Bible it says, um, what? I hate when I forget Bible verses that I'm quoting. Stony heart of sin for a soft heart of flesh. What order does that go in? Chronicles, anybody? Nobody knows that one. Well, I'll make it up since nobody knows. It's Ezekiel? Oh, okay. Well, the whole idea is get rid of your hard heart. And get a soft one. Right? That's the, 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 the whole thing. We are getting a soft heart tenderized towards the Lord. And so what do, why do we, like what hardens us? Why do we stop feeling? Why do we decide, hey, emotions are crazy. Let's throw them in the trunk. Let's just avoid them at all costs. I'm going to talk about a few things that create that. If you believe feelings are weak, how will you ever allow yourself to feel? So right now in culture, um, I feel really sad. In American culture right now, if you're a man and you feel things deeply and you're passionate and you care and you're tenderhearted, you're gay. And I hate that. I married the most manly, hunky, connected to his heart man I've ever met. He's like David. He's present and he's real and he's engaged and he feels things strongly and he's passionate. And it doesn't mean that that's the epitome. I mean, he's the epitome of perfect to me. <laughs> I'm not saying everybody has to look like that. What I am saying is most men in America, in our generation right now, have been told the lie that if you feel you are weak that you're broken, that you're a pansy, that you're a sissy. Women too, we decide it is safer to be unaffectable. I would rather be unaffectable. So I'll be that girl that like, oh, whatever, you don't wanna call me back, whatever, I'm fine, I don't care. I don't feel. See how cool I am? I don't feel about anything. <laughs> you can't shake me. Yeah, say the worst that you got. I'll walk away, all cool like, cause I got a heart of stone. Like, that's actually a goal. Like, people don't say it like that, but the goal is, I will be strong if nothing affects me. I remember my pastor's wife, I had this guy break up with me, and it affected me. I was crying, and so she said, you know what, Abby, this is the most beautiful thing. I was like, what is beautiful about this? <laughs> she was like, you have gone through a lot of pain and you have never shut your heart off. You still gave it fully. The fact that you feel pain means that you actually engaged. You actually showed up. You actually allowed somebody to affect you. That is, if you can't allow people to affect you, there's a, a way that you don't allow God to affect you. I don't ever want to be cool. I want to be that kid that's like, God, get me, get me, get me, get me, get me. I would rather spend months weeping on my face before the Lord than be like, I'm a cool Christian. 
I don't feel anything. I'm a rock. <laughs> okay, you get the point. Another reason that people throw their feelings in the trunk is because they've grown up with feelings being crazy and out of control. So if you grew up and your mom raged at you, or you grew up and your dad was an alcoholic and he made irrational decisions, and your life was always up and down, or if you grew up watching somebody and they were depressed and all they ever did was cry, and all they ever did was um, mope around like Eeyore, like... Humans are really smart, and we're like, oh, that looks horrible. I think feelings are stupid. That's what we do. We're like, my life feels horrible because they're driving their car with kids. So the way that I'll prevent myself from ever being like them is throwing my kids in the trunk. I will have logic protect me. I will have logic show up and take care of me. Because feelings aren't safe. And here's the thing. Most of us, if you've had, has everybody had like some crazy person they see that has crazy out of control emotions? And you're like, that does not look fun to me. Here's the interesting thing. I, I work with people about connecting to their hearts. Because, you know, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, like your heart actually is important. There are way more positive verses about your heart than there are negative in the Bible. It's like a thousand to one. Um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of good verses about your heart. And so you can't actually be connected. Most people have disconnected from their hearts because they have learned, they think crazy people who are emotional are connected to their hearts and they don't want to be like that. I just want to tell you, if you were around a person, you know, I was around a person who was suicidal. My mom was suicidal and depressed my whole life. So I get it. I was around somebody whose emotions ran the show. But I'll tell you, she was not connected to her heart. People who are connected to their heart do not let their emotions enslave them. God did not create us to be enslaved to emotions. That's why I love the life of David, although he did let his emotions enslave him some when he followed Bathsheba. That's why he's a great example. Be emotional. Don't always follow them. But the whole idea is most of us make vows about emotions from the people that we've seen that have hurt us. And those vows feel really safe to us, but it doesn't necessarily help us in relating to God. One of the things that I have found is people believe I'm only allowed to feel if it's logical. And that feels really safe. Like, I'll be logical and then no one can ever hurt me. If I have all of the right, like, I believe I'm right in this fight because I can prove that you're wrong. I will, I will stand up for this because I know that I know that I know that if everybody looks at it, they'll believe that I'm right. So we, we have this group of people that are like, throw the emotions in the trunk unless we can prove them. And this is what I think about God. Jesus, he's going to Lazarus' death. He knows Lazarus is dead. He's planning on bringing him alive. He's already told people he's bringing him alive. And he stops to weep. Why do you stop to weep when you know you're about to bring somebody alive? And this is what I see happens in Christianity. Christians think, oh, to have emotions, to have faith, means you have no emotions. You don't grieve, you don't feel sad, because faith means, no, Lazarus is coming back. Why do I need to cry? It's not sad. I know he's coming back. I know. Faith means I don't feel anything. Well, Jesus didn't do faith that way. Weeping was not doubt to him. Weeping was humanity. I've watched so many people push their emotions down with religion. You can make things real spiritual. Oh, I don't need to cry because my daughter died because she's in a better place in heaven, so I have no feelings. No, Jesus cried and Lazarus wasn't even dead forever. You know, I see people with, um, they use religion as like a band-aid. Like, oh, I don't, I don't feel anything before the cross. 
Before the cross, nothing actually mattered. Now after the cross, it's all good. I want to tell you, Jesus likes to get the whole thing. He wants your whole life. He wants as much before the cross as he wants after the cross. And he wants love to get into every single freaking corner. All of it. So I remember my husband, he had a face-to-face encounter with God. And he sees Jesus and he never has felt more loved in his life than in this moment. And Jesus comes up to him and says, I'm going to do something he'll never forget. And he touches him. And as soon as he touches him, Justin says it was like he shot out from side to side, traveling at the speed of light. And all he could say was that he felt like he was traveling from the beginning of time to the end of time, from the beginning of time to the end of time. And he was feeling the love of God be infused into every part of it. And I want you to know that if you have emotions about your past or there's still things that you are working on getting healing for, even if it was before the cross, God wants to get his love in there. He wants every area of your life under the authority of his love. So is speaking truth and declarations over pain valuable? Yes, as long as you're not stuffing your emotions down to do it. There's this thing, I want you to imagine putting a Band-Aid over a cut and then putting the Neosporin on top of the Band-Aid. Is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) We might need to teach you some things. (laughs) This is the thing about God. This is what David understood. I have to get out what is going on inside of me. I have to be real and honest and I have to purge it out with the Lord so that his love and his healing balm and his anointing can get in. That doesn't give us an excuse to sit in pity parties. Because I said, you know, don't let them, don't put them in the trunk, but don't let them drive your car either. But it does mean you get to take anything that you need to talk to him about and you get to take it to him. And you get to know that he cares about it. He cares about every aspect. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. It says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And I'm not talking about just sad emotions But I want you to know that if you don't actually receive the comfort from God in your heart, you don't have comfort to give away. You have to actually open up your heart. So everyone, I want you to close your eyes. If you're in here, if you're on Bethel TV watching, I want you to put your hand on your heart. I'm just going to have you repeat after me. Heart, you have permission to be wide open towards the Lord. to be fully present, to fully feel, to be fully affected. You have permission to know that he's emotional about you. You have permission to know that you don't need to be shut down. You don't need to be locked up. Heart, any place where I've stopped feeling because of pain, because of vows that I've made, I give you permission to open my heart back up to you. I want to be like David. I want to have a heart that's fully after yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Emotions are meant to be our check engine light. Emotions are meant to be the thing that tells us, hey, something's going on inside. And so if we throw our emotions to the side and we never pay attention to them, we miss the problem thing. It'd be like, I want you to imagine you're driving in a car and your check engine light comes in and you go to the mechanic and you say, hey, Could you turn this check engine light off, but don't tell me what's wrong with the car? How many of you think that's a good idea? 
How many of you know, like, you're just going to be driving, waiting for an explosion at some point? Some kind of something's going to happen in your car. This is what emotions are supposed to be. They're not supposed to lead us, but they are, like, they're like a, hey, 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 something's going on inside. You need to pay attention. There's something that you need to know is happening. I remember, um, so when me and my husband got married, we kind of had this thing like, hey, if we ever felt, okay, I grew up with a pastor and he used to say, if you confess the little things, you'll never have big things to confess. And I've lived my life by that. You confess like five steps before there's even a line. Does that make sense? So if I'm like, I want to go buy a Ferrari, I'm going to confess it before, that's not a sin. I don't know. That, I just, that was the only thing that came to my mind. Sometimes I think, God, like, why did you pick me? I have weird things that come into my mind while I'm speaking. So if I'm like, I want to steal something, I would confess it before I got to the store. Right? You're like five steps in advance. So I remember I am, um, we, we decided like, hey, if there's ever any time that we get attracted to somebody else, we're going to do something, we'll confess it, get, and figure out what it is way before there. So I, we, um, we had a trip, it was years ago, and I remember I felt just drawn towards this guy. Now, drawn is like five steps before attracted. It's just like, oh, I feel this little pull. I feel this little pull towards this guy. Now, if I have shame about my emotions and I just stuff them down, what would I do with that? Oh, it's fine. I'm a Proverbs 31 woman. I'll declare over it. I'll rebuke the devil, which is also sometimes valuable. I'm not saying don't do that. Get out of here, Satan. In the form of being drawn to this man. But what I actually, what I actually did was like, okay, there's a check engine light going on. Bleep, bleep, bloop, bloop, bloop. This means something in my engine isn't working right. I need to pay attention. So I processed with my friend, and, um, and she said, we, we talked through it, and what I realized was this guy had a very even-keeled personality, super, like, steady, stable, just you're never going to see emotions out of him. Now, when I told you about my husband, how, did I describe him like that? No. When I met my husband, he is like a, he is an Italian, okay? We fight hard and we love hard. And when I met him, I didn't know that he grew up in, an al uh, in a home that had rage. So when I married him, it was quite a surprise the first time he raged at me. Uh, whoa, I did not sign up for this. Who are you? Okay. And the Lord was really gracious and kind, and, and we walked through a lot of his childhood trauma, and he got a lot of healing. And we walked out the process together, and it was very beautiful and redemptive. And so here I am, a couple years later, and I'm like, I'm drawn to this guy who's super steady. And then the Lord spoke to me. You have some pain you haven't dealt with from your husband having rage. Now, see, if I had ignored the check engine light, hey, something's going on inside of you. Or if I had had shame over it, like, I must be a harlot. <laughs> I'm drawn to another man. Then I would never have gone to, see, what happens is if you stuff down pain, what happens is you just push it down, you push it down, you push it down. It becomes subconscious. And then what happens is your subconscious pain leads your life. And then you get confused why you are all of a sudden having an affair when you are happily married. Then you get confused while all of a sudden you're having a complete life breakdown when just a little bit ago you were fine. Then you get confused like, why can't I quit looking at porn? What's going on? My desire to look at porn, you know what that is? That's a check engine light. Something inside is missing. Something inside needs truth. Something inside needs healing. Something inside needs love. Pretty much what I could pretty much tell you. Any check engine light, you get it down to the core, it's that you need more love. 
God's love heals and fix everything. It's like the one-stop mechanic shop. Whatever problem your car is having, there is one oil that fixes it all. It's the blood of Jesus. So here I am, and I'm like, okay, there's a part of my heart I didn't even know was still sad or hurt about that. So what did we do? We went and I went into counseling. I was like, okay, there's some stuff that I need to get through that I didn't even know was there. You know what? As soon as I figured out what it was that being drawn to him was gone. This is what it looks like to say, I don't throw my emotions in the trunk. So when it happened, I didn't just shove it down. But I also wasn't like, oh, my heart is saying that I should go towards this man. I'm going to do that. We're living in a society where everything is about follow your heart. And honestly, one of the main parts of my ministry is connecting people to their heart. But we have the wrong definition of that. That doesn't mean you get to do whatever crazy thing you feel. That's being a slave to things. No, God came that he could actually set us free. That we could actually know the truth and we could make decisions in agreement with the identity of who God is in us. Emotions are meant to give us clues. If you don't feel one day the feelings will pop up. Feelings buried alive never die. So here's what happens. You're living your life as normal. You're like, I'm good, 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 I'm good. Oh my gosh, I spent all of my money and I'm in bankruptcy. How did that happen? Because I have shoved so many feelings down that all of a sudden there was one moment that triggered it, tipped the, it's like having a, cup that is filling with water, and then all it takes is one drop for it to spill over. And so here's what we do. we got to take our hearts continually before the Lord. It's the most beautiful thing. You Like, this is why quiet time matters, because you're actually connecting with yourself and connecting with God, so you actually know what's happening inside. If you don't know what's happening inside, you're living as reactors to everything. Then you're living out of triggers, and that is not kingdom. I'll tell you, when I am being triggered, I'm not the best version of Christ. I went on a vacation. I'm in the middle of, my family is going through a crazy thing, crazy thing. God's in the midst of it, but it's crazy. And so I went to Hawaii this year, and I was like, I'm not thinking about my family at all. I'm going to have the best vacation. I'm going to take all my feelings about my crazy life, and I'm going to shove them in a corner. I was like, yes, Lord, the beach, I feel you, I love you. And so we go through this whole, this whole wonderful vacation. And I come back and everybody's like, do you want to move there? I was like, no, because I can't live with my feelings in the box. Hawaii was great because they fit in the box. But I remember I get home and I had this event that really, really pushed my buttons. It had nothing to do with my family. And I, had, I was like, I need to process. I call my friends. I have like some some button got pushed from this trip that I really need to talk through. You know what it was? It was that stupid box leaking out. It had nothing to do with what I thought it had to do with. It was about the thing I was jamming back. Stay back there. That is why quiet time with the Lord is so productive. Because we go to him and we spend time and we say, search me, God, and know me. What is that? He knows us. He searched us. He knows. We don't need him to search us for his sake. We're like, come here. Come talk to me about what's going on inside of me. And it's not all based on that. There's so much relationship with God, but it has to be a part of it. And we have to have no fear about going to the deep places with God. If you have fear about going to the deep places with God, you'll miss the depth of encounter that you can experience. So that is the feeling side. Now we're going to talk about how not to get trapped by being enslaved to your feelings. So I know a lot of people, they've like, you either live where you're like, all logic, I don't feel, I don't hear. Or you are the person that is like, I feel everything. I can't walk into school without being crazy. All my feelers are happening everywhere. I go up, I go down. By the end of the day, I've had an emotional workout. 
That is not what God intended. That's not abundant life. I lived my life as a slave to emotions. I lived, and when hopelessness showed up, it beat me down. When hopelessness showed up, it was now my master, and I had to follow it wherever it took me. When fear showed up, it was bigger than me. And I was like, yep, I'm just afraid. Now I'm going to have anxiety attacks. I did not know that I was made to be more powerful. Emotions are not meant to ruin your life. But far too often, that is our experience. Because, and <laughs> okay, so I want you to imagine, take them out of the trunk. They can sit in the front seat or the back seat. Let them play and be happy. If they drive your car, you will go into a cliff. Or the median, or you'll kill somebody walking. <laughs> this is what my life felt like. Because when I grew up, my emotions, like I told you, because I had crazy hormones, I just learned that you just follow your emotions wherever they go. I was very tired and didn't have a lot of time to figure out things for the kingdom of God. Because I was surviving my life. We were given authority over emotions. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a? This is real. He came to give us a sound mind. And if I, with crazy hormones, can have a sound mind, you can too. The fruit of the spirit, one of them is self-control. We were given the ability to have power over our emotions. I remember this, um, <laughs> I never thought that this would change my life, but you kind of have these moments in life that feel very normal at the time, and then you look back and you realize that you've remembered that forever. When people pa um, preach, you should know that. Oftentimes the things we're telling you were very normal when they happened. Except, you know, like if you raise the dead, that was not normal when it happened. So I remember I'm watching this, uh, actually it was in BSSM school, and they were playing this Bob Newhart video from SNL, Saturday Night Live. And it's him as a counselor. And this woman comes up to him as a counselor, and she says, I'm afraid of being buried alive in a box. And he says, has, ever, has anyone ever tried burying you alive in a box? She said, no. Oh, so you're just claustrophobic. She said, yes. He says, I'm going to say two words to you right now. I want you to listen very carefully and then take them out of my office and incorporate them into your life. Stop it! <laughs> stop it! And he literally yells at him, just stop it! And then she has, it's like an eight minute long clip, clip where she's like, well, I'm anorexic and bulimic. He's like, just stop it. <laughs> well, my mom used to always call me fat. Well, just stop it. It is hysterical. And I remember watching it laughing because, you know, like I am accounts, I do consulting with people. So I thought like, oh, that's funny. Sometimes I wish I could just play this for people too. I get it. I never thought the Lord would use that to scream at me. And that's what he does. I will tell you, on a regular basis, my mind will be going somewhere, and Bob Newhart will be like, stop it! <laughs> I'll be like, whoop! Okay, I got that. So this is what I, I want to tell you. We have some power here. I'm going to tell you some of the do's and the don'ts that I live by, okay? Because I feel like it is my job. I am the queen of this city, okay? God showed me one time that my body is the temple, and he showed me it like a city, and he said, Abby, um, how many of you guys know Gotham, Batman? So Gotham is a city, and all of these um, criminals came into the city, and they took over, and they corrupted the city. So God showed me, he was like, in your city, shame has corrupted your city, and fear has corrupted your city, and hopelessness has corrupted your city. And he was like, you need to take your rightful place back. You are the queen of your city. You need to take your city back. You need to say, uh-uh, not in here. No, 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 this temple will not be ruled by fear. You need to actually declare, like, I am meant to be in charge of this. This is the one thing I have full authority over. So I don't really like giving away my power to other things. God was like, you need to tend your garden. 
So in um, Song of Songs, it says this. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. So I see it like this is my plot of land, and anytime a fox runs in, it's my job to kill that sucker. <laughs> Eric and Bill would fully agree. Shoot that thing. Mount it on the wall. <laughs> it is my job. Anything. So, like, I think this is my land, and I have a lot of hope, and I have a lot of peace, and I have a lot of joy, because that's my inheritance as God's child. He said, I came that you would have abundant life. So my plot of land says abundant life, whether or not I figured out how to get there or not. And I'm like, I'm going to go, and I'm going to tend my garden, and I'm going to kick out anything that steals abundant life from me. I'm going to go after it. So when I see a fox, it's my job to be like, uh-uh, get out. This is my land. So I have several areas that I've learned that I just have to kick the fox out as soon as I see it. So here we go. Maybe. Oh, yep, here we go. Do not meditate on things that don't produce hope. Now, here's the thing. Okay, so Bill Johnson talks a lot about not being introspective. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't know what's going on in your feelings. And it doesn't mean that you don't feel things. And it doesn't mean that you shove your feelings in a box. What it does mean is that you don't do introspective. <laughs> you don't do introspection that causes you hopelessness. And there's a lot of introspection that causes you hopelessness. And sometimes I'm like, hey, does this feel good to me? Is this going to produce good fruit? I remember today I had this thought pop into my mind about a mistake that I made. And I was like, will thinking over and over and over again about this mistake that I did produce good fruit? No, it's not going to help me not do it again. It's just going to make me feel horrible all day. I don't have time for that. I like life. I like abundant life. I thought that verse should count in my world. So do not meditate on things that don't produce hope. Do not have vain imaginations. This is what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So when I talk about vain imaginations, the first thing I think is future tripping. As soon as you start to have fear about the future, you're living in a made-up world. You are making up a world to be tormented about. Mark Twain says this, I have known a great many, trumble, a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. <laughs> you only have grace for today. That's it. You got grace for today. So as soon as you're worried about five steps down the road, you aren't even imagining the future with God in it. Do you know what? We imagine the future without grace. So if you're looking at it and you're like, wow, my job just ended. What am I going to do with finances? Natural human is, I don't imagine that God's grace is showing up. I remember I used to be terrified my husband was going to die. And God told me, I want you to imagine that if he died, my grace would be there. Because I don't, I don't have a promise where I can be like, he'll never, ever die. I mean, because... I mean, he could, that's possible. Jesus might return. But I, I, there's not like a guarantee you'll never go through hard things. He's like, but I want you to imagine his grace in it. So I was like, I imagine that if my husband died, God would have encounter after encounter with me. He'd send people to stay in my house with me. He'd bring people to hold me. He'd have an incredible redemptive story. I'd probably get taken to heaven to see my husband and God together. <laughs> like, I'm like, if I'm going to imagine the future, I'm going to imagine it with God's goodness in it. I don't have time to waste my, like, why would I give my emotions to a fake world that doesn't exist? That's a vain imagination. Okay, that's future tripping. Anytime you are thinking about something that causes you worry or anxiety, what does it say? Do not worry about tomorrow, for today has enough. Be present. It's like the Israelites, they wanted to collect manna for, like, the whole future. God's like, no, no, today is enough. Just chill out. 
It doesn't mean we don't plan for the future, but do not think about the future without God's goodness in it. Very rarely do people go there and have his goodness painted. Okay, the next one, the next one with vain imaginations is do not imagine that other people are thinking about you negatively. I had an encounter once where um, I used to have these horrible nightmares where I just saw people's faces. And I'd wake up and it was so traumatizing and I'd go to somebody and be like, what was your nightmare? Did somebody like kill you? Were they chasing you? I was like, I don't know, there's people's faces! <laughs> They'd be like, what? I'm like, yeah, just faces everywhere. Did they say anything to you? No. Did they do anything to you? No, just people's faces. For years, I was like, it was the worst torment I'd ever experienced. And I was like, what is this God? What is this God? And God's like so fun. He takes you on journeys where like you ask him some questions and it's like years later. He's like, oh, I'll drop the answer in now. <laughs> I have this encounter with the Lord. He says, Abby, the people's faces are what the accuser used to get you the most. You are making up what they are thinking about you. The voice of accusation literally steals from you because what you have made up, they think about you. So I have this rule. Let's say I'm sitting here and I'm like, oh, Chris Gore hates me. He hates me because he's leaning on his knees. Because that's what we do. We make up. We make up an entire scenario of what we think because of his knees. If I think that, I have a, a plan I have to immediately make up five good things he could be thinking about me. He could be thinking, wow, I'm so relaxed. I'm going to get in a more comfortable position because she is like watching a TV show. <laughs> he could be thinking, this is so enthralling. I'm leaning closer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I'm going to imagine. Here's the thing. God said, if you're going to live in a made-up world, why not make it a nice one? I'm, here I am, and I'm in my abundant life land, and this face comes in that says, oh, they thought you were stupid when you prayed, or they thought you didn't. No, I don't have time to imagine fake people thinking bad things about me. That's not biblical. How much time do you think Jesus was like, I wonder what they're thinking? No. Make up something good if you're going to make it up. Okay. I do not connect failure or hopeless thoughts. And this happens a lot. It'll be like one thought. It'll be like, oh, I, I forgot to take out the trash today. And then right after that comes the, oh, my gosh, I'm really not good at remembering how to do house things. Oh, my gosh, I forgot to sweep today, too. Oh, my gosh, Justin really didn't know that I was going to have so many problems cleaning the house. Oh, my gosh, I can't remember how to be on time on things either. I'm a horrible human. I can't do anything right. <laughs> I shouldn't even be alive. I'm 33. How did I forget to do anything? That literally happens within like a minute. I'm feeling fine, and now I feel like I'm the worst human in the world. Or what will happen is I'm like, oh, my gosh, I think that that person really misunderstood me. Oh, I remember this other time this other person misunderstood me. Oh, my gosh, and this other person. Oh, my gosh, I have 30 examples of them misunderstanding me all at once. Ah! I must be misunderstood my whole life. I have this thing like one bad thing, that's it. If I'm feeling about this misunderstanding and any other misunderstandings try to connect to it, I say, no, not today. You can come up later when you're by yourself. I will not be bullied by a gang of negative thoughts. I've only got energy to fight with one. You're not going to hit me over the backside because I'm like, no, no, no. You come back later. We'll deal with you one-on-one. -on -one. Okay? Do not go over all of your mistakes and disqualifications. You just can't do it. Once you do one, you just keep going and going and going, and you're like, oh, remember that one time I messed up then, and then I messed up then. And I, When people are trying to get free, like maybe they struggle with bulimia, and as soon as they make one mistake, they tie it to every mistake they've ever made. And as soon as you tie it to every bad thing, hopelessness has rushed in. No, kick that fox out. One. 
I'm not going to, I literally will be like, yeah, maybe I messed up right now. I'm going to face this one failure, and I'm not going to let any other failures into this moment. This is singular. It has nothing to do with anything else. And if I have a day, like you walk into school, um, if you're not from in school, it could be any atmosphere. You walk into your job, you walk into anywhere, and you immediately feel like a gunk on you. You feel the funk. Those are times when I say, I'm not thinking about anything. Just zip my, my mind. You walk into where it's like, oh, I hate my life. Like there's sometimes when I go um, into department stores and I walk in and I immediately feel ugly. And I know like, oh, this is here. This is in the store. So I'm like, I will not think about buying clothes. I will not think about my body size. I will not think about my money. I will not think about anything in this store because there is a funk here. And I do not want it to filter towards me. I have this idea like, oh, no, this is just not the right time to think. Some days are not good days to think. You woke up, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Do not think about your life and where you're going and what you're doing. Be like, I will think about my life and what I'm doing on a day when I wake up on the right side of my bed. Set yourself up for success, people. We're like, oh, my gosh, I'm just struggling with the Lord. And, and I think today is the day that I should think about what I'm doing with my whole destiny. <laughs> just stop it. Stop it. Now is not the time to process that with the Lord. Okay, I'm going to keep going through this real quick. Where did they go? Okay. Do not follow people on social media that make you jealous or angry. Just stop it. Unfollow them. Anything. That's like a fox. If you see a fox that runs through here over and over and over again, go find the den and be like, no, Instagram, I can't follow you. Get out. Repeatedly think through reasons you are bitter. Don't go over and over and over it. It won't help you. It won't fix the situation. You won't get healed. Do not gripe with fellow complainers. I remember I was in the season and we all didn't like our jobs. And so it felt fun. You know, like, I hate this. I hate this too. I hate this too. And you're like, we're commiserating. And then you walk out and you're like, I feel horrible. Just stop it. If you want to talk bad about your job, talk bad about it with someone who has hope. So it's only your gunk with them. Let their hope make up for you. Don't grab a hold of other people's hopelessness. We got to use some common sense here. We got to decide like feeling good matters to us. Okay. You're getting the point. Do not watch heavy news or heavy TV shows if you struggle with anxiety, depression, or negativity. I only watch comedies because I have enough drama in my life. You don't have to only watch comedies. I'm just saying. Again, think through, what do I need to guard my heart? It says guard your heart above all things. If I want abundant life, then anything that is going to add to unabundant life, I want to kick it out. Okay, we're on the home stretch, guys. Then we're just going to do some ministry. Philippians 4.8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think on such things. This is one of my favorite quotes. There are two wolves fighting. One is darkness and despair. One is light and hope. Which one wins? You guys know the answer? Whichever one you feed. That's how it works. Whichever one you feed gets stronger. So this is what I do. Practice. Okay? Go ahead. I practice changing channels. What that means is as soon as I have this thought that is taking me down, the bad path, oh, my gosh, I'm failing at everything. Oh, my gosh, I'm a horrible Christian. Oh, my gosh, I'm never going to make money. Like, I know my triggers. I can now spot them. And I can be like, oh, it's going this way. Oh, no, that train, i got to stop it before we get a mile down the road. So I've practiced changing channels. I'll be like, I'm failing at life. Let me think about something I love about, about outside. I remember uh, practicing changing channels when I was younger, and um, God told me not to date for a season, and so I was trying to not think about guys, because I was like, the whole point is that I have it set aside to just hang out with God. And so a guy would pop into my mind, and every time a guy popped into my mind, I had a person to pray for. I was like, Satan, you're going to get real sad that you keep tempting me about this guy, because every time you do, Chelsea's getting healing. <laughs> 
So if you have a negative thought that keeps coming at you, pick somebody to pray for. I remember when I had a body problem, a pain, and so every time I thought, oh my gosh, this hurts so much, I prayed for somebody who needed healing in their body. I'm not going to let this pull me down. So I worked on changing channels. Feast on love. I do, my whole life is about this. It'll change you. Love is the atmosphere that switches things the fastest. And so what I do, I remember one time, Eric and Candace just said, come sit with us in a, in a spot where I felt really loved by. Do you know, I think about that one time as often as I want to feast on it. I'm like, they invited me to sit by them. That's amazing. They've invited me to sit by them lots of times, but I'm like, I'm going to feast on that one moment over and over and over again. And it's inconsequential and it doesn't even matter, but I felt loved and seen. And I'm going to think about the times I feel loved. And I'm going to, you know how we go over and over and over again, our past sin, the thing we're trying to get fixed of, our fear. We're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be homeless. I don't want to be homeless. I don't want to be. Why don't you think about the times you've been loved as repetitively? I do that all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, that one time Ben came up to me and he just held me and he encouraged me. That felt so good. I'm going to think about that three years later. Why should I stop feasting on love once it's happened? Then the other thing that I do is when things are rough, I think about things I love about people. If I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a hard day. I'm like, okay, what do I love about Julie? I love that she's smart and she's intelligent. Why? Because I'm switching the channel to an energy, a frequency of love. It is the kingdom. It is stepping into God's heart because God said that if we are like him, we love one another. And so I'm going to posture myself back into the flow of abundant life. And I'm going to think about everything I love about somebody. Because that's one of the fastest ways to get out of a funk. And then I'm going to call them and I'm going to tell them. Because when I get, now here's the thing. I've been introspective in the bad way. Where you just think, I've been, I've had sickness in my life. And I'm just laying there and you're like, I can't do anything with my life except watch Netflix. I've watched all the shows that are worth watching. Everything's horrible. And you know what the Lord will say? Go help someone. Get your mind off you. So we, I'm saying, do not, don't throw the emotions in the trunk. I just spent the whole first part of this talk saying, like, I'm not saying shut all your emotions down with these tools that I'm giving you. Feel what is real. But then there's sometimes just shut it down. <laughs> this is the balance. We live a life in tension. And this is what it looks like. Okay, so feast on love. Love others, help others. The best way to get out of the victim mentality is to help someone else. Think about what someone else needs. When you think about yourself for too long, you will always get depressed. Always. It just never fails. Play the thankful game. I can't tell you how many times I'm like, my day is in that, you know, the momentum where the ball starts rolling and one bad thing happens and then another and another and another and another. And you're like, this day is never going to end. I'm like, okay, I'm going to stop. Let's play the thankful game. Hey, stranger, let's talk about things we're thankful for. I'm thankful I'm breathing. How about you? I literally will go through, I remember one time I saw this um, book, this guy wrote a book, and he used to be homeless, and when he learned that thankfulness is in every single get rich book, every single self-help book, thankfulness is a core tenet of all of those, he's like, I better be thankful, and he was homeless, and he had a pencil, and he said, I'm so thankful that I own this pencil, and I thought, I never have an excuse again. Never. And so I, when my body doesn't work, I think about everything that does work. I've got eyes. Yes. I've got two hands. I can move. There's a lot that is right with my body. And if you start getting lost in everything that isn't going your way, you know we do that. We're like, God doesn't answer prayers. I still am not married. I'm still not healed. My finances still haven't seen the breakthrough. And you just, we meditate over and over and over again on the gunk. And then we sink out of abundant life. Okay, so I'm almost, this is, here we go. Let's finish this. Play the thankful game. Be honest. Oh, wait. Yeah, be honest and have people pray for you. If you're having a rough day, yesterday after I cried about America's Got Talent, I was like, I got to call somebody. I'm crazy. 
So I called my friend Jess. I said, I'd be crazy today, girl. She said, I got you. And I could literally feel grace instantly. It works. Ask for encouragement. Say declarations. Just do it, whether you feel it or not. It will change things. Read the Bible, worship, pray in tongues. When you are stuck and you cannot get out, praying in tongues always works. Because it's not skipping to the logic. It's not throwing your emotions in a trunk. Tongues fixes everything because it gets you out of your mind and out of your gunk. And it pulls you into the spirit. The Bible and worship also do the same thing. Um, think about how much you have grown since. So, like, I always think, like, I've grown so much since last week. I've grown so much since last year. I'm so different than five years ago. Because I need to feel momentum in my life instead of, like, the mountain is bigger than me. And the last thing is practice self-control. It's an art that we have lost as a society. Fast sugar. Fast media. Fast something. Don't go crazy with food. No eating disorders for the Lord, Okay. I've been around the block. I was friends with every person who called it fasting, but it was actually not. So fast something healthy for you. <laughs> but practice self-control because we should not just be having these crazy emotional explosions that take us out in our lives. So, Joanna, will you come up here? Here is what we're all working towards, Okay. Knowing when you are releasing an emotion versus feeding a, mon a monster. So there's sometimes when we need to release an emotion. We need to get on our face. We need to be like, I'm angry at you, God. Why won't you show up? I need you. Why haven't you answered this prayer? We are allowed to do that. That is, that is a good part of relationship. God wants to bond with us through that. But sometimes when you do that, that's just pity. Sometimes you're just feeding a hopeless monster. How do you figure the, how do you find out? You just practice. <laughs> You're like, oh, I let my heart cry. And at the end, I was like, no, no, that was just pity. <laughs> You're like, oh, I shut that down. It's still there. I actually need to feel it. It's just trial and error. The rest of your life, you're going to be growing and you're going to be figuring out, oh, I should feel this and I need to take it before the Lord. And, oh, I should shut this down now. And it'll be a balance because everything's about relationship. You actually have to trust God to tell you how to do this. I didn't give you a formula that you can figure out works every time for everything. You're going to have to actually ask God. God, is this a moment when I actually need to find out why do I feel so much shame? Or is this a moment that I just need to kick shame in the face? You've got to have both. So I want you guys just to close your eyes. If you're in here and you, we're going to we're gonna do several different calls for all the things. But if you're in here and you're like, my hopelessness and my shame and my fear and my emotions, they run my life. Like I don't actually even imagine what it would be like to be able to kick them out. Like whatever they say happens to me. If you are a victim when, and your emotions drive your car, I just want you to stand up. And it may not be every time, like my emotions drive my car sometimes, but sometimes I got them reined in. But if you're like, I, I'll get into a funk and I can't pull myself out. I get shamey and I can't get my way around it. That doesn't mean you're the crazy emotional person. It just means sometimes I get stuck. I feel like God wants to impart the power to take your city back. I feel like he wants to impart the power for you to get to have abundant life back in your land. For you to get to actually be like, no, no, I get to decide what is in my temple. I get to decide abundant life and hope and peace and joy. So God, we invite you. If you're around somebody standing, will you just put your hands on them? Oh. 
I give you your power back. I give you your power back. This is your city. I know that it has felt crazy, and I know that you learned at a young age you didn't get to have a voice about what happened in your city. But tonight, declares the sovereign Lord, you get your city back. I release life, abundant life, and hope, and peace, and joy. God, when the thoughts rage against them, would you, would you provide a way out? Would you provide a door out? When it feels like I can't get around this wall that is right in front of me, God, would you show them the doorway through? God, I ask that you would release the, the beauty of self-control. The beauty of self-control. If you're in here and you didn't stand up for this, but you're like, I don't have self-control and I need it. I am driving me. I'm not driving it. Would you also stand up? We want to pray that self-control actually, godly self-control. He didn't make us slaves again. It was for freedom he set us free. So God, we release freedom over their hearts that they would have freedom to choose, that they would have freedom to say yes, and they would have freedom to say no, and they would have freedom to choose life, and they would have freedom to choose love, and they would have freedom to choose breakthrough, that they'd have freedom to choose to open their hearts, that every place where they feel like they are stuck and they don't have a voice in their own life, give them their voice back. I release a new day for you that you would feel the power of God, the Holy Spirit presence of truth rising up inside of you, starting at your toes, rising up all the way to your heart, that you would actually feel power from on high, that God's saying, you get to have your voice back. I want you to see whatever it is that you feel encaged by. If it's shame, if it's fear, if it's addiction, whatever you feel encaged by, I want you to see God opening the door and saying, you were not made to be a slave. You were not born to live in slavery. I came to set the captives free. So I release breakthrough over your life. Divine ability to say yes and no to things. him giving you your keys back. I see him giving you your keys back. He's like, I trust you. You have the power in you to make good choices. You don't have to be afraid. You haven't, you're not so far gone. You haven't lost yourself. I bless you. I bless your mind. I bless your mind to grow quiet. When, when the storm rages around you, for you to have an ability to duck into peace. For you to have an ability to duck into love. In Jesus' name. We cover you with the emotions of God. Peace and hope and joy.
I have another group of people that I want to have stand up. If you are in here and you're like, I need to have my heart tenderized towards God because I've numbed it out, I've shut it down, I'm the person that doesn't want to deal with feelings ever and I've locked it up or I have covered over everything with logic and you're like, I actually, I would like to encounter God, but I don't even know how to feel. That feels scary. If I feel, I'll never stop feeling. If that's you, I just want you to stand up. We're going to do like so many of these. You won't even, no one will know you stood for any of them. Like to end the service with altar calls like Catholic Church. Up, down, up, down, up, down. you God the warmth of God it's the fire of God that thaws our hearts it's the fire of God that breaks off the pain and breaks the yoke every place where we've had to grow cold because we've had to shut down every place where you've had to protect yourself every place where you actually had to insulate because there was too much and you had to survive I see God saying I'm gonna light the fire in your heart again I'm gonna tenderize you again. I'm gonna let you feel again. I'm gonna call you back into warmth again. I'm gonna call you into connection. And he says, some of you have never actually. It's been so cold and so dead for so long. And he says, I'm gonna heal it. I'm gonna heal it. I'm gonna come in. I'm gonna breathe to the lifeless places inside of you. I see you. I see you and I see the pain that made you hard. And I want to give you comfort. I don't want you to be alone in this. I love your heart, he says. I love your heart. I love that you would stand and ask me to get you, get you, get you. God, we invite you, the tenderness, that your tenderness would woo us again, that your romance would soften our hearts, that we would Feel the connection of heaven with us. Awaken hearts. Awaken to love. We give you permission to sing again, hearts. You were made to sing. You were made to be alive. I call your heart to life. I call your heart to life. Every place that your heart has felt dead and dormant, that you've been wrapped in the grave clothes, I hear God saying, come awake, come alive again, hearts. I will give you a tender heart. I hear him say, I'm gonna be so gentle with you. I'm gonna be so gentle and I'm just gonna breathe and I'm gonna whisper into the places that you can't imagine that I can get to. There's no part of your heart I'm not after. If you're ministering to someone, you can keep praying for them if they're in a moment. If not, I want to call for another group of people to stand. If you're in here and you, oh, the Lord came. Yes, Lord. Is that you? It is. It's him. Is that done? Is that done? Oh, no, it's back. Okay. Here he is again, guys. If you feel like your connection with him has been interrupted and you could feel him very strong and then it just felt like he cut out. You think I'm kidding, but this is how the Lord talks. So if that's you, stand up. You're like I was feeling the Lord a lot and then all of a sudden connection with him just shut off and I need him back again. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to roar like a lion, to stir like fire. Awaken their hearts to connection and love again. 
you're an emotional God and you feel emotions about your children. You feel longing and compassion and joy and hope and fierceness and protection and you want them. You want them, you want them, you want them. You're not giving up. He says, there's no distance between us. I'm right here with you. I'm right here with you. There's no distance between us. I am saying, I'm closing the gap. God's saying, I'm talking to you in a new language. If it doesn't sound the same as it used to be, it's because it's a new wild adventure with me. And you don't have to be afraid that just because it doesn't sound like it used to, that you failed. I hear God saying, I'm going to come after you until you recognize how I'm showing up in this season. ministering to somebody about that, I want you to just stay with them. I hear God being like, whether your heart got interrupted or not, I pick up right where I left off. The song just jumps right back in. I have one more, um, Thing I want to go after. If you're in here and you have made vows, um, I got a testimony this week from a woman who was in a place, and I did an altar call for this, and she had made vows that she would never have emotions. She'd never let the emotions in her car because her parents were so crazy. But I will never be like that. If I open up to emotions, they'll just go nuts. And so if there's anyone in here and your parents were crazy and it made you be like, I have to protect myself, emotions feel crazy. Or even like the spirit of God feels crazy because it feels out of control. If that's you, I just want you to stand. I just feel like God wants to heal places where you haven't felt safe. So we just release safety over your heart. We release safety over your heart. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that when I had emotion, I used it against you. I stole from you, I took from you. I'm sorry that my emotions felt crazy and you never knew what was gonna happen and you never knew what was gonna go. And it, you always had to be on edge and you always had to be making sure that everything was fine. I'm so sorry for every place that you felt broken because emotions were used against you. And God says, I'm the safest person you'll ever meet. I'm the safest person. My heart is tender and gentle first towards you. And I give your hearts permission to know that you can be unlocked without becoming unhinged. That you can open up and let intimacy in closer and you can let love in closer. And that doesn't actually mean that you're gonna get hit out of nowhere like you did when you were growing up. So God, we ask that you would restore. You would restore hearts. We just release healing and kindness and gentleness. And I give you permission 
to let go of all of the vows you've had that you'll never be like. And I give you permission to become who you were made to be. You don't have to live your life in reaction to the people around you. You can actually become who you're made to be. You don't have to live your life in reaction to the past. You can actually be who you were fully made to be, fully alive, fully present, fully yielded, fully given, fully safe. Jesus' name, amen. This is for sure our last one. If you're a man, I just want you to stand up. Now, if you're a single man, would you just raise your hand? Any girls, you looking? You looking? This has nothing to do with anything spiritual. Just hope for the crowd, that's all. Hope for the crowd. Rachel, come on up here. Take your peek. No, I'm just kidding. I get, I get, I get, I get. Church is meant to be fun. God was always at parties. He was throwing parties all the time. He was the happiest person. Do you know that both tears and laughter heal your soul? God designed it that joy and emotion could actually bring healing to us. And men, I think your emotions get attacked more than any other thing in this day in this culture. And we need your hearts fully alive. We need your hearts fully alive. Women are drowning if you are disconnected. The family system breaks if you're shut down. And that's not shame. That's saying, hey, we actually need you. We need your heart. We need your passion. We need your voice. So if you're around a man, I need you to go and I need you to put your hands on them. And if you can, you don't have to do this. If you can, would you get down at their feet and would you pray over their feet? If you speak a spiritual language, I want you to speak in tongues over them. Right now, I want you to declare, God, that this would be a man after your own heart. That this would be a David. That this would be a David who's passionate and released and has no shame and no fear. And is fully running at who they were made to be. Men, I give you permission to feel deeply. Every place where there's been judgments made, or there's been things spoken against you where you're like, no, I just have to be fine, I have to be fine. I have to not feel, I have to provide. I have to do all this stuff. Every place where no man taught you that you were allowed to feel, I give you permission to feel. You cannot heal until you feel. I give you permission to fully connect to the God inside your heart to fully feel the God inside of you. I give you permission to feel. I give you permission to have emotions. I give you permission to connect. You are never meant to shut down. I give you permission to go on encounters with God. But actually, there's a place we can go with God with our heart that we can't go with our mind. Because God is out of control. God does wild, crazy things that our logic doesn't understand. There are so many places that God wants to take you that he needs you to be connected to your heart to go there. I give you permission to have deep intimacy. I give you permission to have deep intimacy, to go beyond logic, to connect with other people's hearts. I give you permission to be vulnerable, to let people in, to let people see you, to not hide. I always say that, that letting people see you is the most courageous thing you could ever do. Hiding is easy, that's why everyone does it. It is the most manly thing you could ever do to not hide, to let people see you, to let people in. You 
It is the most courageous thing you could do to let people affect you. No one wants to be in relationship with a stone. No one wants to be in relationship with a robot. If God wanted that, he would have made a bunch of robots, but he didn't. You get to be wild and crazy and passionate and break the rules and be whatever you want to be. You are the most like Jesus when you are connected to your heart. He felt sadness. He felt anger. He felt brokenness. He did not shut down. You are the most like God when you connect to your heart and your emotions. And to people. No man is an island. You are not meant to be alone. alone. You're not the one person who is supposed to take care of everyone by yourself. That is not who you are. I give you permission to need people. I give you permission to need people. I give you permission to not be the pillar all the time, to be the person that falls apart, to actually lean back into God and let him hold you and take care of you. As women, we kneel at your feet. We say, we need you. We need you. We need you. We give you permission to be giants in the faith. We give you permission to be wildly set free, wild at heart. We give you We say you have full room to be who you were created to be. God, release them from fear. God, give them courage. God, give them hope. God, give them vision. Let them see all that you have for them. Let them see the land you made for them. And give them courage like Joshua to take their land back. Give them courage like Joshua to, to stand up for what they were made to stand for. Give them hope about who they were born to be. We bless you as image bearers of God. We need you as image bearers of God. And we release you to feel fathered by God and to go be fathers. God, give these men a heart wildly after yours. Let hope arise in Jesus' name. We just release vision over you. We release destiny over you. We say, yeah, God, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him. We need them, God. Get them. Wreck them again and wreck them again and wreck them again. If you're in here and you're praying for them, I just want you to stand up. I want you to all join hands. We'll end this with just a heart cry. Not like I'm going to make you yell. I just mean like a heart, like our heart's desire that God would encounter us deeply. That whether it be that we need to feel more or whether it be that we need to have him set us into abundant life more, that either way he would just radically encounter us. So I just want you... I'm going to have Joanna sing that God would burn, that he would have permission like wildfire to burn, like it's burning in the U.S. Dear God, would you stop it in the U.S. and would you start it in our hearts? Would you stop it in Montana and Oregon and all of the Midwest? Would you stop the fires and burn inside of us? If you're in here, I want you to speak in tongues. If you can speak in tongues. If not, you just, you ask for a burning. God, burn in me, burn in me, awaken me. You have permission. All of me, all the time. All of me, all the time. Fully yielded. Wreck me, God. Past what my mind knows. Past what I think I understand about you. You have full permission to inhabit this vessel. Shura da 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 ya, shura da 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 ya, shura da 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 ya, 
our heart cry God that you would have all of our hearts and any area of our heart that we've shut off towards you any area of our heart that is cold towards you any of our area of our heart that we don't have access to we want to be able to give you all of our hearts so we need access to all of it so we can give it to you so you have permission to burn in our hearts Till they're fully given and fully consumed by you. I just see this picture. I saw this picture of a heart. And I saw this picture of just a light shooting through one spot. And then it just cracking. And all of a sudden, fire and warmth and love coming through every piece. And I, I heard God say, some of you are going to leave. And there's going to be like one little thing you feel tomorrow that you've never felt. And you're going to be like, wait, I've never thought about that. I've never felt that. What happened? Where is that from? That means what is going on? Anything we feel is an invitation to invite God into a deeper place. And so I just feel him being like, there's going to be little buttons I push where I put my thumb on your heart. And it's going to be an invitation to let me in closer. Because he wants fully yielded, fully consumed. And he wants full intimacy. So God, we love you, we want you, we'll never stop wanting you, and stop the fires in America and the hurricanes. God, would you really do a hurricane in us? Do it in our hearts. Do the fires in us. Do the weather system in us. Stop it in the U.S. Don't let the rocks cry out. Let us cry out. In Jesus' name, amen.